And so he started to look for me. And so after a while, I'm like, like, uh, what do you need? And he was like, hey, I have this program. I really don't want to cancel it. People are already coming. Could you hold the fort until I come back? I was like, okay, sure, where is it? Just happened again to be right next to my house. I was like, oh, okay. I don't have to spend much going anywhere. So yes, I can do that. That whole week when I held the fort down, um, they came back, we were doing the courses. I was, I was in just seeing what people were doing. And so after the week, when I was talking to the trainer, who I think was from Canada, I was like, I like this. This sounds very interesting. Yeah. But I don't have the patience to be a coach. <laughs> so what else is there? <laughs> I don't have the teaching skills. So what else is there that works for this? Like, what else is there? And so he was like, yeah, you can come in. You can see we have management. We have this. We have this. And so I was like, okay, let me see what else I can learn. And so I first started with different set, different classes on, I started with coaching a bit and I was like, that's not for me. Then I, then through, uh, through my links on LinkedIn, um, one of the people who's currently still one of my mentors introduced me to something called the business of football. And so when I took that class, that entire class, I was like, this makes sense. Yeah, I like this. I like where this is going. Exactly. And so I reached back to him and I asked him, do you have more of this? Hello. <laughs> Hi, how, are you? how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And you? Very well. Very well. See, you are... You are maybe the fifth uh, guest of mine that uh, arrived uh, early, <laughs> very early. <laughs> well, you know, no, no, you arise before time. Yes, that, that's the right thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought usually when it, when it is a podcast or something, you actually need like a five minute leeway just to ensure tech, in case of technical difficulty or something. You're yeah. able to fix it before it well, starts. See, I, 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 will, I will say this to you again. You are uncommon. Oh, okay. Yes. That's good see, to know. <laughs> see, your thinking is exactly my thinking, the way I do things. I come on, I come online to make sure everything is okay, you know, yes. but you are uncommon, okay? So I say thank you for, for, for that, all right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> So, man, uh, see, I always like to talk to people who are doing uncommon things, okay? Uh, you yeah. are in the, in the sports industry, okay. yeah? Mapping out a lane as an entrepreneur in the industry, right? Yeah. So, uh, I think... Uh, is something that um, we are say society need to take advantage of because having a big population of young people who are very excited to play and what sports i don't i can't imagine why africa is not dominating the sports world, not only as players, but as people who are making massive amount of money. Um, actually, uh, for, for me, I believe that uh, it's deliberate. The system has been deliberately designed for Africa not to really come out of this its cocoon really? in terms of yeah, in terms of it being exposed, because look at the situation of myself. By the time I was looking for studies to actually do, my initial plan was let me study at home. Let me study in Africa, let me school for it. And the two I could find were either in Egypt or South Africa, and they required me to be there physically. But when I went fully into the education aspect, it was just when the pandemic was starting, and the can like the world was shutting down, so ninety percent of Europe went to digital studies. 
Okay. Africa shut down. Okay. So I ended up having to go to Europe online to learn what I wanted because I was not finding it or I was not finding it locally. But you see, it's by design. But because sorry, we, we sorry, no... but by design, by design, by who? Um, I don't know. I think I think at this point it's going to be collective. <laughs> okay, okay. See, we can see, fully Simboa, blame Simboa. This this is yes. a, a fantastic way to start a conversation. But but you ha you haven't introduced yourself. So yes, no, that that's not that's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Okay, I got excited because see, I'm a big sports fan. Okay. okay, I used to play. I I I used to play. I used to I used to play sports when I was younger. I'm a big big sports fan. Okay, so when I see yeah. somebody who loves sports, who does something in sports, I get excited. So please, please introduce yourself to my audience and tell them who you are, what you do, so, so that we can we can continue this exciting conversation. After all right. Uh, to the audience, I am Siombua Ekiboe, a uh, Kenyan. I am the founder and the CEO of the company Steer, that's S-K-E-I-Y-A, which is a company that was came about because of the need that I saw, what Africa was missing. And I realized that um, I'm in a position as an African to be able to kind of fix a few things but also bring the African sports into the 21st century. And so that is what my entire team has been working on since Skia was founded. And that is to, put, is to make sure that we retain most of our athletes, but at the same time, we are able to create environments for them to thrive locally. And then this is through tech, through education, through playing the proper studies for coaches, and also being able to bring in women on boards, not just as players or as NGOs as we are always being seen, but also as people who can contribute into this fantastic field professionally. Good. Fantastic. Yeah. See, Thank like you. I told you, I'm excited to have you here. Okay. And uh, we have started a conversation in a very ex exciting way now. Yes. You say the way the system is designed. Now, see, what is my goal in doing these things and challenging what you're saying is that I want us to, to take advantage of every opportunity presented to us. Yeah. That's one. Two, I want us to create opportunities. This is something we haven't done well, creating opportunities. Now, we talk about a system. A system was created by whom, for whom? See, these are things that many of us don't think about. So, Maybe it was designed, the system was designed that way. But see, one thing I, 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 I talk, talk to people, people about, we can't blame people who create a system for not designing the system to work for us. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, I agree with that. Very good. Really so we need, we need to always think about that. Before we say... Yeah. They are creating the system to eliminate us. No, the system was not created for us. Us, yes. Okay. Again, yes, Good. that is very true. Good. So if you want, if we want to be involved in, this, in the system, then we need to find a, a niche in the system and modify it. Modify that niche. For it to work for us. Work for us, yes. Actually, for me, I believe that we are not recreating the system. It's already there. What we need to do is actually take advantage of it. Okay, good. Because you see, 
if we look at it in the situation of we as Africans, we've always been, um, the system has been created for us to always provide service to other people, mm, mm. but never was it to provide service to ourselves. And this is something that has continued up to today, because what mostly, if you look at the academies that are training, their main focus is training to give players to Europe, players who can succeed in Europe. So we are still working the system in a way that's not benefiting us, because one thing we're supposed to be doing is retaining our players, keeping our players, and paying them enough that they are comfortable to be at home. Now, we've seen this with South Africa, and we've seen this with Egypt. Egypt retains most of their players because they're very comfortable playing at home. They get paid enough to play at home. So what is it that Egypt and South Africa have done that the rest of Africa has yet to discover? And those are basically the systems that ha we are supposed to be asking Egypt. We see what you've done. We see how you've done it. Now teach the rest of Africa on how to take advantage of the system the same way. Excellent. Because for me, as much as uh, most of my studies were in Europe, I realized that even when I was studying, uh, I was studying, no one mentioned Africa. Okay. I was an African in the room. And so I'm asking people like, hey, um, why are we not studying about African football? Why are we not ask, studying about African sports? And everyone, even the lecturer was like, oh, you guys do that? And you're like, huh? Of course, if you find me in a class, it means that I know back home there's an opportunity that we can take advantage of and we are able to be able to produce the same. But you see, that also opens the eyes at my side to, okay, then we need to do this home so that now, instead of us complaining that we are not on the discussion table, we actually bring our own seat to the table and say, hey, we're here. Exactly. And we have the population. We cannot have France having 100% African players and seeing their friends. We can actually retain our players. We can pay them and they can play for Africa. Good. See, Timbo, see, uh, maybe this discussion would go a little bit differently than I planned. Okay. But this discussion we're having, it's a vital discussion and it cuts beyond sports. Yes, okay, because see, uh, I can I can I can tell you this. I hate complaining. I do. Too. I hate blaming. <laughs> see, I just posted. Oh, let me read it to you. Uh, on my Facebook page, I just posted it less than thirty minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, let me read it, read it to you. It says. The hardest thing for individuals and societies to do is to take full responsibility for things that happen in their lives. Yes, I agree. I believe we all, as individuals and as a society, need to take responsibility, responsibility. for everything. I'm not saying with some everything that happens in our lives now okay. taking responsibility doesn't mean you cost it okay see th this is this is something that people don't understand when i say this to people many get angry that why are you asking me to take responsibility for what this this person costs no that person cost it or some whoever cost it but who is suffering from it? You. Your reaction to what was caused yeah. is the situation we are currently in right now. Good. It's our reaction to it. Good. Now, so if you are the one who will suffer from that, whatever was caused, who will have to take responsibility to sort it out? If, you, if we wait for the people who caused it, in quotes, where would they do that? They're not suffering. They created from a system that works for them. Exactly. That's what works for them. So we need to create a system that exactly. works for us. Good. Yes. That's one thing. Okay. Secondly, yes. see, uh, I'm a very I, I love I love history. Uh, my father was a history teacher. See, the the the, the books on this on this row behind me are all history. 
I have three, a full shelf on that side full of history books. So I love history books. History shows that the dominant society do not create things for the for the rest of, of the world. They create things for themselves. for themselves. And the rest of the world need to go there, walk there, and learn things and take it back to their own place. Bring it home. That is how we as human beings have always done things. So now in this era, we who are behind are not blaming the ones ahead of us to why didn't you create this for us? I think I, I said to myself, what are we doing? Nobody's coming to create anything for you. Exactly. You have to create it for yourself. See, one, we need to take whatever they, are, whatever they have done Take it back home, be redesign it to suit our society. Our society. And yeah. if we do it very, very well, they will eventually come to us and say, Wow, they have done this so well. Ah, they have they have solved this problem we have. Let's take it back. That's the way humanity has always progressed. Yeah. So this thing about us complaining that the rest of the world should do things the way that, that would benefit us is ridiculous. And it is, it's, and it's a big thing why we're not, we're not catching up because we're waiting for them to do it for us. It's not even that. It's because, and also I agree with you there, because the one thing that I've realized with a lot of the people that I've worked with is we have this uh, savior complex, I think I can call it that, is where we're always waiting for a savior to come to us. Yeah. But there's no savior coming. Like that's, they're they not coming. There's, Nobody's there's coming. coming. <laughs> now, the people who are coming are coming to take advantage of this savior complex that we have. Yeah, exactly. See, we have the, re- like this is Africa. We have all the resources that we need here. We don't even need to leave the continent to go anywhere else, which literally means we can develop everything here without, without even having to require any funding from the West. Mm. We don't even need well, the West that, to come and tell us. That's how they agree with. Okay, we finish. Yeah? No, because no, what I mean is that look, look at cricket. Everybody knows cricket for India. Yeah. But reality is cricket started in Britain. Yeah. Just India decided. Football like, starting in Britain. Like this. Yes, I'm like we like this sport, but let's tailor it for our people in a way that can work for us. Exactly. And now everybody, nobody remembers there was cricket in Britain a few very many years ago. Everybody sees it <laughs> in India. Yeah. But you see, India did the, what what we are trying to do. You see, as much as football has been a very European sport, it's still part and parcel of the African community. Yeah, we have a football culture the entire continent. Right now, we're in the middle of Afcon. Yes. I'm still a little bit pissed off with how it's being managed and run because this is supposed to be the biggest thing. Like everybody who's coming to Africa should be talking about it. Yeah, but we can learn from this Afcon on what they've not done and fix it for the next one that's coming, mm. which is actually coming to East Africa. And so we, the East Africans now can show what and how it's supposed to be done and why it's supposed to be the biggest uh, game in Africa. Yeah. I saw a conversation with some of the, some of the, I think it was Mane who had said that he feels very disappointed that some African players are quitting their national teams to go back to the European teams. You will never see a European quitting their team, whether it's in Qatar or something, because they are in UEFA. And you're like, you see, we've, there's a way where we've, we've created this mindset that the European League is more important than ours. And we need to change that concept and see the value of 
what we can produce here mm. and then now change the narrative for everyone. Okay. But now, if you no know one is coming to change that narrative, it is us who have to take our collective responsibility okay, to do okay. it. Okay, uh, see, uh, I, can't, I don't want to use the word patriot, but I'm, I'm a patriot, okay? I live in England, <laughs> but I'm an, I'm, I'm a Nigerian patriot. I'm an African patriot. Okay, even though many people, because I, I think a little bit differently, and I ask us also to take more responsibility. People think um, uh, I'm working for Europe. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> anyway, see what you said. It's what a patriot will ask people to do. But see what I've discovered. Uh, I say I, I, I read a, a lot of history books. I also read a lot of econo economics books. See, everything in, in life, everything, including politics, is hinged on economics. Because you want an advantage over another country or another player in a sport, it's, it's somehow linked linked to economics you want that advantage to enable you to get ahead so now unfortunately unfortunately because our countries haven't designed the sports in a way that people can take advantage do their sports within Africa and be able to feed their families. But that young man or that young woman is playing for a team in Europe who is able to do those things for them. Now, I will tell you, as a Nigerian, there are players that while playing for Nigeria, they get injured. And unfortunately, our country didn't take very good uh, uh, take care of them. And they lost a lot. Their family lost a lot. So see, until we take care of our players, that their economics are taken care of, while playing for their nation, the African nations, unfortunately, people would take their clubs above their countries. Now, you say yes. no European would take their club above their country. They won't. Because why? Because the country okay. takes care of them. Yes. That's it. It's simple. The question is, are we incapable of taking care of our players? Okay. But you see, those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Yeah. Are we really incapable of taking care of our players? Why not? No. We, we, we are very much capable of doing it. But why are we not doing it? Okay. See, see that, 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 will go to, looking... that will go to politics. Yeah. Huh? And we'll be indi indicting some politicians. And... Uh... No. <laughs> I don't want to... Be, like Like... But one of the things I've always been was has been non-political. And that's because personally I believe that uh politicians and politics and the government will conform to what you're doing, but they will never start the project. The the leaders will never start a project. But once a project is running and it's running successfully, they will adjust to the project. So you see, this goes back to the private sector. Look at Nigeria, look at Kenya, look at half of this, all of these countries. We have so many football clubs, many. Africa as a whole has 50 what countries. We have 50 something federations. So which means never once are we ever speaking in one voice. Do you see that? So for me to be able to even start a football conversation, even with, my, with the Federation for Africa, it means I have to bring 54 voices into one room to have a discussion. Why? Okay. The rest of the world speaks in one voice. 
Okay. Europe have their own. No, you never find that we have. Europe doesn't have a hundred different people representing coming to one room to have a discussion. No, they have one body. Why do we have fifty-four bodies? Okay. See, I I I will answer that. Uh, I will. This again, people might think uh, I'm anti-Africa. I will say this to, to us. Okay. Again, look at history. When did African countries start acting together? When did, uh, correction, when did African societies, okay? Because, hey, our countries are just uh, less than uh, six, 70 years ago. Oh, okay? When did our, our societies start acting together? Very, 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 very recently. Recently. Okay? See, our society, we have not built the infrastructure, the integration. See, you, Europe, Europe has been working together. Now, when I say working together, they have been fighting themselves, killing themselves, cooperating with themselves for nearly 2,000 two years. Two, nearly 2,000 two years. The Arab countries, through Islam, okay, and North Africa, have been working together for 1,600 years. Sub Saharan Africa, when did we start? You see, they, see uh, I would say this. I just I ha have a, 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 a uh, video on my personal channel, and I talked about why I'm not a Pan Africanist. See, mm -hmm. we, when we talk about these things, we don't delve into the fact that. We are very new people. Our our integration and cooperation is new. Exactly. Okay. Now we don't we don't analyze the reasons why we may not be working well together. We only just want let's have you African unity. But yes, if we want African unity. First, we need to know why we don't have it. But I, I will tell you this, I've seen many, many prominent Pan-Africanists brush all these things away as if they don't matter. And I will say this, I will say this until we stop brushing these things away as, as if they, they don't matter, African unity will never happen. Yes. So, so uh, yes, we want to be able to speak with one voice, but we need to have we need to have conversations on the differences, the different yes. ag agendas of different societies. See, Africa is the most diverse continent in terms of tribes, in terms of languages. In terms of different peoples. Okay, so until we realize that we are actually, yes, we are black, you are black and black. Okay, we look very much alike. But I'm, I'm telling you, when we start digging into your thinking and my thinking, I will say, I will say this you find, we find that maybe we have things similar. Because you are Kenyan, I'm Nigerian. We have maybe read similar books. We both speak English, right? So we'll find out that the things that are common between me and you are things we learned that we got from Britain. Yeah. Now, colonizer influence. Exactly. When we dig it into it, into your culture of your village and my culture for my, for my village who find out that they are very different. Exactly. These are things that many Africans haven't thought about. They, they dismiss all these things 
but they are very important. Anyway, uh, we have uh, rant a lot about these things, but hey, this, this conversation is one I want us to continue having, all right? I really want us to continue it's having It's definitely a much needed, but it's, it's a much needed discussion. Yes, yes, it is a much needed discussion. Now, okay. let me, let's, let's go back to my, my original <laughs> agenda. <laughs> yeah, football, <laughs> sports. Right, so tell me, tell me, uh, you are a sports entrepreneur. So yeah. tell me the story. Tell me the story. How did you get there? What, what attracted you into this? The only funny thing is sports found me. Mm. Uh, it wasn't something that I was going around to look for or something that I ever thought I would be in. Despite the fact that while in school, I was actually a swimmer and I did play tennis. But after that, I was it. Like me. You know, that... <laughs> Never once do you ever think that along the line, that was, that's what I would say the ancestors were still waiting for me to catch up on. So what happened was that um, a couple of years ago, I had a very, I uh, still have a very good friend of mine. Um, he's from Uganda mm. and he was hosting a program here in Nairobi and he was doing a purchase course for the, the whole of Africa, basically. And so he had invited a good number of coaches from different countries to come through. But on the last minute, unfortunately, he had an emergency and he had to go back to, to Uganda for yeah. a few days. But he didn't want to cancel the program because everybody was already flying in. Mm. And, at the, and it, was, it happened to coincidentally be at a time when I'd just quit my job and I had nothing else to do. And I didn't even know what I was going to do. So he, started, <laughs> so he started asking around common friends like, can, can somebody hold the fort down? And for some weird reason, everybody suggested me. And so he started to look for me. And so after a while, I'm like, like uh, what do you need? And he was like, hey, I have this program. I really don't want to cancel it. People are already coming. Could you hold the fort until I come up? I was like, okay, sure, where is it? Just happened again to be right next to my house. I was like, oh, okay. I don't have to spend much going anywhere. So yes, I can do that. That whole week when I held the fort down, um, they came back, we were doing the courses, I was, I was in just seeing what people were doing. And so after the week, when I was talking to the trainer, who I think was from Canada, I was like, I like this. This sounds very interesting. Yeah. But I don't have the patience to be a coach. <laughs> so what else is there? <laughs> I don't have the teaching skills. So what else is there that works for this? Like, what else is there? And so he was like, yeah, you can come in. You can see we have management. We have this. We have this. And so I was like, okay, let me see what else I can learn. And so I first started with different set, different classes on, I started with coaching a bit. And I was like, that's not for me. Then I, then through, uh, through my links on LinkedIn, um, one of the people who's currently still one of my mentors introduced me to something called the business of football. And so when I took that class, that entire class, I was like, this makes sense. Yeah. I like this. I like where this is going. Exactly. And so I reached back to him and I asked him, do you have more of this? Like, I want this behind the scenes. I want to see what people are doing. This is the, this is what nobody sees. Everybody sees the players on the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> but the business of football is everything that makes sure those players get on the pitch on that day for you to be able to see it. Mm, from mm, sports, mm. from the lawyers, to the doctors, to the management, to the TV crew, to the IT team, everything. And so I was like, this is what I want to do. And so that is how I got into the business of football, mm. rather than business of sports. <laughs> and wow. now, after a while, I said, now I want to bring this to Africa and to bring yeah. this back home. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the opportunities are massive here. We have the people, we have the young generation who's hungry for something else. This is a field that is not very traditional. No two days are the same. No one day is the same. Even when I wake up in the morning, I know no one day is the same, <laughs> despite the decision making that we have to be in. I am constantly 99% of my life in class studying new things 
and that's because this as like the world is evolving so it's not really waiting for us to catch up so we have to catch up with it we have to work with it and then work towards pulling africa to it by force like now we have no choice of we are not begging like you have to catch up with everybody else because yeah. if you if you're looking at situations of where we are now talking about um ai and people are using ai in football games and we are still talking about traditional holding a camera on the field to film players playing we are still way far behind but i yeah. still think with so much tech right now we're able to come to much faster wow the wow yeah. i'll tell you <laughs> i'll tell you see there are so many opportunities in various areas of life that's just thinking about it blows my mind see you were able to take up this opportunity for several reasons one somehow you have a uh, expose yourself as a person who is good at taking challenges for those people that person told hey i want somebody who can do this and they mentioned you see you did it you did that because if you have not posi positioned yourself as the kind of person who can do this kind of things nobody would have mentioned you True. so i give you that i give you that mark excellent see many people don't understand many young people don't understand that the things you do today will ev eventually put you in the space where someone says something and the first name that comes to mind is yours Yours. you did that now when you now saw the opportunity you also saw many other opportunities and then you started asking what else can i do what else is there <laughs> yeah what else and you're here yeah. Ex explore exploring some maybe <laughs> weird <laughs> opportunities <laughs> many more it's like it's such a fascinating industry i mean it, it never gets old of how excited i always get to learn new things because there's so much to learn but it's so much for one person at the same time i'm like i still want to i remember like there was someone who was saying like just pick one thing and go with it because you don't have to do everything and i was like but i want to know everything like every single thing that i do like I start and I'm stuck somewhere and someone says, because like there was a time when I was doing contracts and there was some, I, I fell upon something to do with the anti-doping agency. Mm. And so the time when I realized, wait, I really don't know much about this. And so I go back and ask one of my mentors, hey, this anti-doping thing is, uh, I know I'm seeing it quite a lot, but I would like to understand it. Yeah. And he sent me to a class in Switzerland and was like, hey, there are actually, there are se several sessions they're doing that covers this under sports law. And so I registered for that class, only to end up getting even more than what I actually thought I would get. But you see, so one part of the education came to something else and then opened this field in sports law. And I was like, okay, so like, I like this. What does this got to do? Right now, I'm following up on international relations with sports. And that's because I realized for me to be able to represent um, Africa in the way I think I should, in the way I want to, it means I still have to have a bit of international relations in me in yeah. for, for us to be able to have these conversations with everybody. Yeah. And so every single step where I reach and where I want to advance, I always advance it now with a bit of education to back it up yeah. so that at least I understand that section properly. So that even when I'm explaining to the young people who are inviting me for mentorship, 
I know what I'm talking about. It's not something that's like, no, you know, I picked only one thing and that was it. No, no, no. I went, I learned, I studied, I practiced, I saw what it is. I made partners through there. And so I'm confident when I'm explaining this chapter to someone. Yeah. Wow. Simbo, see, you, again, I'll, I'll use the word, maybe, maybe because I've been out of, the continent for some time i don't know how dynamic people are now but i talk to a lot of it, loads of young people but you are you are you are very unique you are see i'm, I'm serious i i talk to a lot a lot of young people you are maybe five percent of the see in terms of your thinking in terms of your strategy in terms of your actions you are pretty unique see as a leader we need you we need people like you who don't on, only take put themselves in spaces to see opportunities but they take the, those opportunities and they do something they go back to study, to catch up, to understand the, the industry, to understand where is this coming from so that you can push it to where it should go. It should be. You see, a lot of young people, young Africans, want to do something, but they don't want to first understand where it is coming from what it is <laughs> or what it is <laughs> see when you don't understand where something is coming from and you're trying to move it to where it's going it's going to go you will never you will never be able to do that because history the history of things determines the trajectory of that thing yeah 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 wow you are unique i'll tell you that <laughs> you know as a young uh, 10 year old we i we lived in, in a close so on weekends sometimes my father my uncles and our neighbors big boys they play football okay and they put me as a goalkeeper <laughs> you know in those days in, in the 80s early 80s and then i i was never a big food of football fan uh, but by 13 years old, my auntie, my, mo my mother's first cousin, she was uh, the champion of uh, oil company co uh, uh, players in Nigeria, tennis play uh, player. So she comes to Lagos to play tournaments. So she comes with bags of te tennis rackets and shoes and that and that. So because of that, I got into tennis. I know she gave me so many kids, so I, I started playing tennis. Uh, oh, also, when I was in about 10, 11, when I got into secondary school, because I was small again, I was a wicket keeper, cricket. My, 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 my school played cricket, so I was a wicket keeper. So I played that, and then I played uh, tennis at, from the age of 13, and then at the age of 14, uh, 1986, when the Houston Rockets played the Boston Celtics for the NBA championship, uh, Oladion was, he, he played for, of course, the records. And then after that series, which they lost, he came to Nigeria. And then because he went to my secondary school, I was friends with his cousin's son, Binga Kaka. So he gave Binga a, a, a basketball signed. And then me and Binga started playing basketball. That was 1986. So today, if I could, I would go and play basketball today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So since then, I've been a fan of basketball. Till now, I watch basketball at least three times a week oh wow yeah that, that's it I, I played from that day 
to uh, my 30s, right? So, see, I'm just telling you this because I'm a big fan of sports. I've gone to the to uh, Old Trafford. I'm a, I'm a Manchester United fan. I've gone to Old Tra Trafford twice. So, I've gone to Tottenham, uh, what's the name of that, whatever, once. I've gone to Highbury, Highbury before uh, Arsenal went to their new stadium. So, so I'm a big sports fan. The reason why I went to this, into this is to show you that Africans love sports. Many of us, we, we millions, millions of us watch and play sports. But no, we have not been able to take advantage of it. So I want you to tell me, where do you see that? Where do you see sports going? Okay. Where are we going? How do we take advantage of, of this love of sports, of playing or watching? First, I will start with sports. Sports, uh, sports, uh, African sports investment is already here. That's that number one. Like the number of companies in Europe and the rest of the world that are coming to Africa to invest in sports is massive. Wow. They discovered the talent is here. Now, the thing is, it's like we haven't caught up with that yet. And we need to. Because... If we don't take advantage of the situation ourselves, the rest of the world will just keep taking advantage of us. Exactly. And, and then, we, and yeah, and then we'll start complaining. It. And we'll still start complaining. We'll be still in the same spot like we are not understanding. Because look at look at the situation we currently face when it came to uh when it came to the current Afghan that is going on. First of all, CAF on its own decided uh, when they were giving out the bidding for the air rights for the games. It's until almost, I think, the day before it started is when an African company actually got rights. Europe got rights. Uh, Saudi Arabia got rights. Everybody else. We, it's only a point where everybody was making noise online. Of, so where are the rest of us going to watch these games? And I do not want to go to Super Sport and I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to Bing and all those channels where I have to download in order to watch. Where in Africa am I going to watch these games? Is where now the South African company actually got the right to be able to do it. And then, of course, now some local channels, which you call the Channel Ones, are the ones who got the free rights, which we have like KBC, the national channels, that were able to get now their free This was on last minute. In my opinion, these were supposed to be the companies that were supposed to be first to get those rights. Okay. It's like when we're talking about anything to do with sports globally, you will not see China coming to a South African company first yeah. before they sort out their own China. It's, it's China first, everybody else later. And if you look at China, China will block, will block everybody for a Chinese company to get the privilege. And that is how selfish Africa needs to be. When we're looking at us uh, investing, I would say no. No, no, no. With us, because you see, we are the only ones who can fix our problems. Yes, the outside yes. world can help a bit, but the solutions have to come from in house. External forces will never come to fix our problems. They'll come to take advantage of our problems to fix for themselves. Anyone, any, any place I go. And I realize there's an opportunity. The first opportunity that I realize is how can I benefit from this? Mm. The second opportunity is, oh, how can the people benefit a bit from this so that I can give them enough to show that I'm helping while in reality I'm using all of it. That's everybody's mentality. And that's what Africa needs to realize. We have we cannot be sitting around and saying we have African millionaires, but we are not seeing their impact in society. These are people we need to bring to the table, sit them down and say, listen, I have a plan. This is the plan. Let's see how we can develop it. Africa at the moment is the only continent that I have seen that does not have its own Premier League or version of a Premier League. 
we watch Europe, we watch China, we watch India. India is coming up very well, by the way. And <laughs> we are watching Saudi Arabia doing Saudi, what Saudi Arabia has, it has been disrupting the La Liga and EPL really badly. We are looking at US doing its own thing. We watch all these things, but we haven't asked ourselves why we don't have our own thing. Okay. I saw people online saying that um, Africa, uh, what you call this, the current, uh, the current games should go on for six months. And so I was like, okay, do we have the capacity to do that? And how do we, how do we handle that? We were looking at the situation and we were asking CAF, hey, can you give us, we need tickets for the current games six months ago, and they came out in December, yet the games are starting in January. Are you seeing why? Because if we had people had tickets six months ago, they'd be able to book hotels, travel, fly way early in advance so that they're able to be there for this one month in order to. It's the first time people have been to court before. How many, not so many people actually were like Ivory Coast was like the ones who were hosting. And so we were like, where is our passion? Where is the advertising? We can't expect Total Energies, that is currently the main sponsor for the, to do 100% only. There's a collective responsibility that we need to take in as Africans and take this thing as our own and go like, this is going to be the biggest event for us and this is what we are going to pump money into. Again, we are complaining that our players are not performing to the best of their capabilities right now in sports. But look at how the national team actually recruits their players. Other than the Margarine, which actually have a standard national team and players who are hired by the government to specifically be for the national team to train all through as a, as a unit. Most clubs will tell you that the national government did an open call, picked two players from team A, two players from team B, two players from team C, brought them together at one place and said, now train together to be the national team. How are you going to perform like that in a game that's supposed to be in two weeks with a team that has been training for the last uh, five years together? You're going to lose. <laughs> You're not going to, I'm like, there's no, you know? And so you come and realize that it's, we are not taking it as seriously as we're supposed to. Mm. We are not looking at it as the investment opportunity that it's supposed to be. You're, everybody's supposed to look at sports as a business. This is a business for the country. Yeah. It's a business for the private sector. It's a business for the club. It's not a charity. We are here to make money. So what do I do? What do I need to invest in? What do I need as output in order for us to get the best output out of this? So that when we are playing for a national team, I'm not going to La Liga to pick the three Kenyans who play there, go to Saudi Arabia, pick the five players, pick two or three good players from Nairobi, and say, now we have a national team play. These are people who have trained in different styles of playing, and then they're brought together to mash up as one. Take a weird foreign white guy who seems to have a degree in sports and say, this is the guy who's going to be the coach. Uh -uh. That's not how you work. It's weird. So <laughs> See, I, I, I I'll tell you. See, I have, I have a scary thought, okay? When you, when you, when you, the way you describe the model of creating the national team you want, it scares me. See, as someone who plays sport and who watches sports, it's, see, that national team who, that work together does where the players don't play for for private clubs i will tell you they will lose from the first game yes they, they will lose see they, they don't know each other hold on they, they will lose see because see national team games happen intermittently okay yeah. National team games, maybe a year, they, they, they come together, they will play maximum 10, 10 games in a year. See, yeah. sports, to be on top of your game, 
you need to do play every week, every week, every week. Competitively. Compet competitive. Okay. That's what people who play for private clubs have the opportunity to do to train, to train at least three, four, five times a week, and then to play one game. Yeah. And then when there's a FIFA uh, week or whatever, they come together from different places. See, the ability to bring players who played different in, in clubs with different styles together, it's very important. And see, one, one thing is this. Uh, our countries need to get coaches that are very knowledgeable. Okay. See, this, this is it. Our countries need to be able to get solid coaches, pay them well, and put resources for them to be able to be able to tr travel around to the to the to the destinations where their where their players play to go and watch them yeah. okay to go and speak with them okay to engage with them yeah so that whenever the nation call on them they will be excited to come one because they are on top of the game because they have met their coaches several times and they are sure the coaches have their best interest at heart. at heart. That's one thing. I want to also address something, something you said earlier. You see, there's no country, maybe just, maybe even China said, there's no country that, de that is developed by, only by its indigents. There's no one. Okay. In fact, see, the most developed countries in the world, the US, see, who, who developed the US? Who, see, who developed the US? <laughs> the Africans. No, no, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. See, see, let, let's not go there. Really hold on, hold on, hold on. As, see, as let, let's not go there. See, so, hold on. <laughs> the, the, the thousands of like... <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not go there. See, now, who developed the U.S.? The indigenous and a lot of people from all around the world. Okay? Yeah. It was an input of a lot of people. The inputs of different people. The inputs of different people developed the, the US. Now, why did it work? Because idea. There's a central idea that allowed different people to come around to this place and make it work. Yeah, true. See? There's a central idea. See, that's something no African country has. No central idea. That's one thing. Two. Well, I think the central idea is there. It's the fact that everybody else will fight the central idea so that they can have a central idea. <laughs> okay. Because a, a lot of times, even when you're in these rooms, I was like I've been I've been in enough rooms in terms of discussing sports. And every time you walk into some of these rooms, you're there to discuss African sports. But the first 30 minutes, everybody's going to discuss EPL. And you're sitting there and you're like, isn't this a it's like why aren't we brought here to discuss what we're supposed to do in developing our continent sports? Why are we discussing other people? And the moment you say that. It becomes it remo it like ruins the mood of the room completely, mm. and then and then again, someone can say something and it becomes an argument for the next two hours. Okay, you leave that room like you have not done anything. Five hours later, no one did 
anything. Okay. And that one thing that was written on the boards is still there. Yeah. No ideas were brought up. No. And you're like, we sat here, okay. 10 people, and nothing happened. But you come and realize, you see, that was the that was those people in the room. Okay. They had the opportunity to actually bring in those ideas and be able to work on plans, but they chose the arguments and the other games and trying to compare as like we're always comparing ourselves to other people without realizing that as we are, as we are as unique as we are. What we can implement can be tailor made for Africa and it would still succeed. Yeah. Now, see. And also, uh, one thing I also learned is a lot of people don't want to expand their education. Okay. Past where they've reached. <laughs> yeah. See, now, uh, I'm not opposed to people arguing. See, I, I was, uh, I didn't like it before, but I've learned that uh, it's vital. Okay, for people to argue. It's constructive, yes. Yeah. Good, good. That, that's the point I was going to. <laughs> See, it must be constructive, right? Constructive, yes. To allow, allow people to express themselves, but in a constructive manner. Okay? That is, that is the difference. That is why those meetings do not come do not end with anything important to to follow up with no. because no. people just argue just to win to win the argument an argument yes okay so they're not arguing because they want to put something out there for people to think about they just want to argue to win the argument and that's it that's it see again again I say, see, for me, what we, even though I, I mentioned that the U.S. works because there's a central idea, I'm not, I'm not arguing for that everybody needs to have work with one goal. No. The central idea was freedom. That's what works in America. The central idea in America is freedom. Okay. Is to allow people to do what they want. As long as what they want to do doesn't impede somebody else. Freedom. Doesn't impede on anybody else's right. Okay? okay. Freedom. That's the central idea. Now, the other thing I want to, uh, wanted to say is this. See, do you know what is the second, second, second largest financial city in the world. Mm -hmm. London, after New York. Do you know who built the London financial district? Foreigners. <laughs> Foreigners, totally. Foreigners. So see, my, my point is this. We want things to work for us, but we, we must not think that we need to do everything by ourselves. By ourselves. We need to attract talented people from everywhere. Now, one thing is this. We have a lot of Africans who have traveled the world as, as talents to build other places. Okay? So, for me, now is the time for us to start attracting back those talented Africans to come and work to build our own continent. We have to create the foundation first. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. See, that's it. See, you, I'm happy you understand what I'm my, my, my argument. See, we need to create the environment that will allow those people to come back here and do what they do. 
what they have always done for other people. Yeah, we need to bring back our talent, but we also need to make it. They need to see the value of value for back. it. Exactly. Yes, because everything is value for money. What's in it for me is the question that everybody is going to ask. Okay. When you start, even when you're going to ask, uh, to request for, although I'm not very pro on this one, because, but I think it's because I'm terrible at it. But most people qu- really like in this industry to go and request for funding. <laughs> mm, mm. I'm more of the person who, let me find channels in which I can create the funding to create a sustainable environment yeah. as opposed to going to beg for funding. The thing is about begging for funding is you have to create an environment where this person who's going to give you funding sees the value in what you're going to put in. Yeah. And then you have to show them the output. I always do a comparison with Shark Tank. When all the people are going to Shark Tank, these are not business ideas they're taking to Shark Tank. These are businesses that have started, that have grown, that have create, that have some have reached to the millions. Now they are there to request for funding to expand, expand but it. also get yes, but also get a shark who has the business idea to come on board and bring something unique to the business. Okay. As Africa, we need to do the same. We yes. need to start. We need to create the environment. And then we invite people. You see, anytime you would like, anytime uh, someone goes to Shark Tank to invite someone to their business, they have the controlling power. Yeah. You're giving me this money for 10% of my company, which means I hold the power on the company to give you 2% or 1%, and then we negotiate. But if I go to a negotiating table with nothing, then they, I give the person giving me money everything. Yeah. So at the moment we are giving out everything because we haven't put something substantial on the table. Okay. And that's what we need to fix. By the time these people are coming to Africa to invest in Africa, they're seeing what they're bringing into. But Africa hasn't stabilized itself enough in the industry to have bargaining power. So even if we're given uh, peanuts. We'll take it because it's in the dollar and yeah. you're very happy about it. Exactly. But in reality is they could give you 10 times more if you knew the value of the product that you had. Yeah. Sports is huge value in Africa. Yeah. The African people are valuable even without the sports itself. So we need to understand our value so that when they are coming to invest, we have bargaining power. Okay. Okay. See our discussion. Yes, even though it's a hinge on sports, we have dissected different things about our continent. Okay. And it's see the only thing that pains me is that uh, we don't have a lot of people who are willing willing to have this discussion. Uh, I've seen so many people, they have ideas and uh, because they have ideas, they are not willing to put those ideas on the table and allow other people to critique it. Okay. They think I have an, an idea and my idea will work and you are not allowed to critique it. And for that, I say no. Yeah. I'm telling you, I say, no, if you have an, an idea, put it, on, put it on the table. Let's dissect it. Okay, let's dissect it to see how valid it is. Okay, we cannot just say, I have an idea. It's a bright idea. It, mu- it must work. No. And see, this is, this is one of the reasons why a lot of things we we implement do not work because we didn't allow those ideas to be critic by other people to see how it work see we don't we don't get buy-in just because we impose our our idea you get buy-in 
by allowing the critics to dissect it and say, okay, mm, okay, this will work on that. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have spoken to you today. See, we have gone way beyond uh, the kind of things I was going to talk, talk to you about, but hey, I'm very happy for this conversation. Now, well, that is the power of sports. Yeah. Sports catches everything. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Now, <laughs> That's the power of sports. It's not just the game itself. It's everything. It influences everything around it. Yeah. Every single yeah. sector. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are an advocate of girls and women's sports. Okay. So, so I want you to tell us a little bit about that. But oh, the reason as to why I started the advocacy for African women in sports, that was because for many a times I was the only woman, one, or the only African woman mm. in a lot of spaces. And so for me, uh, you come and realize that there were spaces where you carry the entire continent with you and you carry the entire womanhood with you. And so my reaction and my decision making in very many spaces was carrying the entire continent and the women of Africa with me. So my representation meant that I was representing the African women and the continent itself. And with that, I realized that the reason is to, okay, when it comes to African sports, it's still not taken as seriously as we would want it yeah. to be. Even in terms of investment, in terms of viewership, in terms of convincing people why they need to watch this sport or yeah. why they need to have women teams. Or even convincing the countries alone to just invest in women teams is a whole battle on its own. Mm. But you see, that came because we are still a minority. And, the, and we, we, we still have cultural and traditions that we have to find a way to balance in this career of sports, because still it's very male dominated. But when I was going through the business of football, the business of sports, and discovering all these new careers that were involved in it, I realized that we can't, why are we limiting ourselves to just the game? Everyone you talk to says, I want to be a footballer. But what about those ones who, like, I like their football, but I really don't want to play football? Okay. What can we open for them to actually see there's value in this in something else? I um part of my education very many years ago when I was still discovering myself, journalism and media studies was part of the uh credentials I got okay. in uni. And that came forward when you discover sports journalism and you discover reporting and you discover and you realize wait. You don't actually just have to be a traditional reporter. You can actually be a sports reporter. When we are doing, when people are studying IT information technology, tailor make it into sports. That's a whole new career line completely. Mm. Law is a whole new career line. Sports medicine, which is something that Africa is craving so much, and that literally took a whole argument almost to almost midnight in a class. <laughs> because I was arguing with a lecturer <laughs> to a point he said, call me tomorrow. <laughs> but that was because I wanted to understand, like when you ask someone who runs an entire department of anti-doping and he says he runs it like in Kenya or in Nigeria or there are three or four in Africa and they're giving you points and you're asking them, okay, then for athletes to be able to always be not or not take any drugs that are on the ban list yeah. do you have doctors they can go to who understand this 80 something document and know that if i go there to a doctor and i say hey i'm an athlete they already know the medicine they cannot take and those ones that they can take do we have a database like that and they said no and i was furious and i'm like so normal general practitioners cannot treat athletes for the right purpose drugs yeah. in order for them to not be banned if they are drug tested. Yeah. So who can we go to? 
And then you realize someone telling you, oh, Kenya only has one doctor. And you're like, one? The whole country? Where the rest? Okay. As in, is, 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 you know? And I'm like, okay. That's what, a what if that <laughs> doctor dies? <laughs> Thank you. We have no one. <laughs> so we go to South Africa. So do we go to the US? Who are doing these studies? <laughs> what if this guy decides he's moving to Europe for the rest of his life? Uh, what happens? <laughs> like, we have no one? Yeah, Ali, you you also have to find one guy. Like, does he have a team that he's mentoring? And so you realize that we have so many gaps in the professional sector. Yeah, that can easily be filled by women, whereby we are, we are not infringing on the playing or sports that men feel like it's their domination, but we can cover all these other spaces as well. Yeah, yeah. So we have the people who who play but we also have people in the professional sector. Yeah. And that's the only way we are able to change the narrative. Mm. Mm. We are able to actually push for legislation that is able to work for us. Mm. We need to get into those spaces, but we have to get into those spaces through education. Yeah. And that is why I'm so passionate in getting as many women on board as possible. Very good. Very good. See, my sister, I would, I would see, again, I will go back to my credentials as a <laughs> as a sports player hmm, in my in my in my days. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I I played uh, pickup basketball for years, including with uh, national team players, Nigerian national team players. Okay, in the in the eighties, nineties, nineties mostly, and a, a few of them in the twenty first century. Okay. So I know a lot of them personally. Now, in pickup basketball, or especially on Saturdays when we played in Lagos in uh, Ikeja Cantonment in Lagos, see a lot of uh, ladies come to play with us. Okay, the place is packed, always packed. You know, uh, only if your team wins that you continue playing. So sometimes you play the first set. And that's the only set you get get, get to play because of the of the large crowd, you know. So yeah, I, I play with so many very good women, but in reality, women and men in sports play differently. Yes, they do. Play differently. See, and I've seen this argument that. Uh, men and women should be played equally. Oh, hold on. Played <laughs> equally. And I've seen it mostly in Europe and in America uh, claiming that uh, the women should be pay played equally with the men, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, when it comes to national team, Okay, because it's not based on on rev rev revenue. It's based on national pride. Okay, so they can be paid equally. Okay, but when it comes to business, the payment is based on the revenue of the business. Yes, it's still a business at the end of the day. Good. Now I will tell you, I have three daughters. Three daughters. My second daughter, she's she's going to be uh, seventeen in two months. She started pay, playing basketball. I was so excited. I used to go to our our, our school games, you know, where not games, uh, training. Okay, I go stay up there, watch her play, all that. But suddenly, just before you no, know, by by the time COVID started, she stopped playing. I, I try to encourage her, just let's go to the park. And she didn't, she wasn't interested. And now she doesn't play. I mean, she's she's not even interested in, in it at all. Even though I tried, you know, to convince her to do, she, she doesn't want to. You see, interestingly, women are not as excited to play or what sports like men? You see, uh, yeah, that. How did you 
<laughs> no, they're, they're not. See, my for my my own experience, women are not a, as excited to play sport. See, when when I was young man, I go to Nigeria National Stadium to watch a basketball game. I've gone to Nigeria and uh, Egypt. I've gone to Nigeria and I can't, I can't see on the courts. I run around with my shirt off, eh? waving it to the crowd around the, the. Yeah, I used to do that. That was how excited I was. Right? So, see, when I say women are not as, as excited, I used to go with my girlfriend. She, she would be laughing at me. See, women are not as excited to play or to watch sports. You I see, sit down here because, watching game. My daughters don't don't even come out from the room. <laughs> but you see, that's because of we've been conditioned for a very long time. Oh that's no! So I I I, dis I disagree. No 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 no! Come to come come back come back home, come back home, and you will hear the same thing see? that sports was for boys and girls. You get to do something else. You see, no, we, no, no. I, I just see again. Barriers. Let me just finish this. See, I grew up in a house. I was the only boy. Okay, my sisters, my cousins, we lived together. My parents never tell any of us to do this or that. My my parents, apart from playing as a goalkeeper as a young boy, my parents did never told me to play this sports or that. Never. I got into it myself. I got into them because several myself. My sisters were never interested. See, today, my sister, oh, football, okay, Nigeria is playing, oh, okay, oh, I do this, oh. <laughs> See, okay, my, my point is this. See, I want, men are, co are very competitive. Women are competitive in different ways. That's now, what are you? They're more calculated. Huh? We are more calculated. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. I agree. Now, let's let's take it. What if? What if women come up with the things they are excited about and start building it into their own sports? See, see, see. The thing is that somehow in the world we think. Both sexes should do the same things. What if women come up with those things that women love to do and turn it into their own sports? And then millions of women will now watch them doing, doing those things on TV and get paid for doing those things. Why must women do exactly what men do? Because society has created this platform that it has to be as so. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? We are still not the ones who are controlling. Oh no! Come on, my sister, sister. No, no, no. My, we my sister. Control I don't, I, level, I don't subscribe to that at all. General. So it's not a general thing. I don't. I see. Okay, I worked in a in a bank in Nigeria where there were more women at senior levels than men. Yeah. See, I, I had three bosses, uh, no, four direct bosses, okay, in my time in, in there. Two of them were women, okay? The second level, bosses two of them were women so see i personally i don't subscribe to this thing that things are controlled by men my mother hold, hold on hold on my mother <laughs> my mother retired as a head teacher she was at, she was in our school she was a boss for almost 10 years my father, who worked in the National 
Petroleum Corporation. His bosses, two of them were women. So see this thing about, for me, this thing about women don't have control. Mm. I ask myself, do they actually want those things? I, I, just, yeah. I just use my, myself, my children, my sisters as example. Okay? Women want different things and they focus on those things. See, I want them to succeed. But see, if we, if we, if we continue pushing them in a particular yeah, direction, they, don't want to they'll, they'll, they won't succeed. For exactly. example, if, if, if that thing of doing a degree and then finally handing it to your parents and go like, okay. that was your degree. Now I need to go and do what I <laughs> <laughs> so see, see you you are talking to you you are passionate at what you do I am, and that I that's it. why you're, you're good at it you love it yes yes but i still have to convince my family as to why i was going into sports okay it took about five years <laughs> it took about five years <laughs> and a nomination for an award before everyone was like, "Oh, so that's a serious thing." <laughs> <laughs> For a while, it was, "Are you still going to go get a job?" <laughs> you know. So, see, these things, these things, we need to think about, talk about, uh, and be very open. See, yeah. freedom again. I, I mentioned freedom, freedom to do what you love you want yes what you want to do yeah see this is something we we need to imbibe in our society to allow hey what do you want okay as long as what you want doesn't impede someone else go ahead hey. you know so yeah anyway uh this discussion has been wonderful see just to just to close it uh i want to talk to to talk about uh, a few things I normally ask my guests. One of them is this. I love, I love reading, okay? So I ask my guests to recommend some books for my, to my audience. So please uh, recommend five books to my audience. So the first book actually was recommended by a friend. And that was because he, he realized that I like to be a perfectionist in almost everything. Okay. And so he sent me a book that I read and it, it made my day. It's become my go-to book now. Okay. And that's the perfect, A Perfect Mess by ah. Eric. I, yes. <laughs> he was like, I need to learn to live within the mess and realize that sometimes mess is necessary. So, yeah. Uh, the second book will be Feet of a Chameleon. This is mm. by Ian Falky. Um, he wrote this book uh, just slightly towards the other side, but when South Africa was hosting the World Cup, the yeah. very first World Cup that Africa actually hosted, and that's for people who actually want to get into the sport. Mm. And this is because you've got, you see, for you to be able to be in this space of Africa, you've got to understand Africa in a way that makes sense on how Africa works. Yes. And then take advantage of that. And that means also reading books that have been written by people on the continent. Um, the third one is a uh, go-to book for me as well. This is Africa Business Resol uh, Revolution. Yeah. This one is the before, the before, the now, and the future in seeing how this business revolution I would like to see that book. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm very interested. Yeah. It's by Archa Archaliki. So it's like it's like actually key. Um, what was the title again? Longer. Africa Business Revolution. Okay. Yes. Um, Outliers by Malcolm. Oh, I, this... I have I have two copies <laughs> on my on my shelf. I've get, I've bought three. Oh no, I bought five. I've given uh three out. Yeah. Yes, I, I like it because um it goes through the the various levels of success. Oh, you are an an, an an outlier. Yes. No, I was like, I, I, I'm, oh, maybe I am. But basically, it's understanding that success doesn't have to be 
yeah. what we've been taught it is. There are different levels of success. Yeah. And so I just enjoying that aspect of just being where you are right now is still success that you can yes. be happy about. And so the last book um, is Vusi by Vusi Sembekwayo from South Africa. Yes, and I, I love that's him. That's a business. That that's a business. Do, do yes, that. I love him I very love much. him as well. I love him as well because I think a lot of times I find myself realizing like I I get what you say. You know, once you once you're in it, you're like, yeah. Because you see, we've got to understand the business aspect of things. Yeah. For us to fully take advantage of what we need to do and where to bring Africa to is yeah. we need to stop looking at things uh, as charity cases. Exactly. NGO. We have, in Swahili, we call this omba omba mentality. This is the beg beg mm. mentality. So everything is always like, I have to beg to get, you know, I have to beg. No, I don't start finding. Oh, you know, I'm a poor person. I cannot leave this particular area. See, if, to... if you bring value, if you bring value, you don't need to beg for anything. No. Yeah. In fact, in fact, that value itself, people look for you. Because exactly. I'm always surprised that people look for me. <laughs> exactly. Every time I'm always like, oh, are you sure? It's like you got the right person? It's like you came highly recommended. You're the person we need to speak to. But it's because like you, you have something that you bring to the table. Yes. And that, that value is what people will invest in. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So wow. those are Thank my five tips. <laughs> very, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See, I don't know how you how old you are, but uh, you, you, I, I, I oh, take you. I'll be eh? thirty nine this year. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah, very young African. Okay, see, yes. good, and I want you to advise fellow Africans. Okay, you are doing something. You are doing your own bit for your society. I want you to advise fellow Africans on doing their bits to the to help their society um, so um i really not good at that advice but <laughs> what i can say you is, have you have a, you, you see you have a lot of wisdom a lot. um something that i realized very many years ago and for a very long time we we're always told this thing called uh, education is the key to success. Mm. This is something everybody knows. So I don't think so. I think finding your purpose okay. and then backing it up with education okay. is the key to success. Oh, I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason as to why I say that is because we have a lot of people doing a lot of aimless education. Mm. I'm in school. I am studying, I have a degree, I don't know what to do, but it wasn't my passion to begin with. I just picked something that went with my grades, but now do I really want to practice it? And so now we have so many people who did biochemistry, doing Me. marketing. Doing... <laughs> <laughs> I did biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and ended up doing something totally different. But you see, it's because initially you thought this is what I wanted to do. You, but you did educate, then you realize that, no, that's not what. So we need to be able to be in a space of where we can tell our, or we can advise our children or those who are leaving high school is find your purpose mm. and then back it with education. Yeah. That way, your work is so easy. For me, I don't even feel like it's work anymore. No. It's no longer work. No. <laughs> like I have, I get so much fun that money is what is the, Money is what is the is the blessing that comes with what mm. I do, mm. but I'm not doing it because of money. It's yeah. it's what comes after what I do. But you see, because I love sports and because I found my passion and my purpose in sports, yeah, I back that up with education. So I am always reading. I'm always in class. Always reading. I always want. Yes, I always want to learn more, because I think every time I finish something, I realize there's something more. So every yeah. single class opens opens the door to another class because I'm like, exactly. it's something that you said and I think I need to go back to. <laughs> so, and I'm always going back to my former lecturers. Now they're very good friends of mine because they're the people who are like, okay, I bumped into this. I know this is in your field. 
tell me more about it. Mm. And so you see, you can only do that if it's something that you're in love with. Yeah. It's something that you really want to do and you really want to know more. So that's my advice. Find your purpose and then back that purpose up with education. Wow. And you'll definitely succeed. Yeah, I agree. I do agree very much. Thank you. Now, my last question. Okay. What is your vision for Kenya, for Africa, for sports in Africa in the next 20, 30 years' time? My vision is we'll be controlling sports globally. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Woo! That's a big one. That's a big one. But I also know that we will be doing it. So it's not even a vision. It's the fact that I know we will be controlling it globally. Hmm. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Woo! See, I, see, as as a sp sports fan, and I I watch a lot of different sports. I can see how challenging it will be. I see. I can see how challenging it will be. Wow. But, it, but you it, can it see people. that it is actually possible. No, see, see, anything is possible as long as the people yeah. who have that vision are willing, willing to work towards it. Yes. You see, that's the the biggest challenge we as Africans have. See, our leaders, I'm not, I'm not just talking about political leaders, leaders in every space, okay. we say things, okay? But we don't follow up with action. We don't back it up. We don't back them up. We just say things because unfortunately, uh audience audiences are happy to hear things that sounds that sound good it sounds really good i'll build you a road vote for me <laughs> okay see we like good good sounding people who tell you bah, 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 bah. what you want to hear but can they back it up but what, what you said that... what you said it's a big, it's a big vision. It is. It's a, it's a big one. What I know is that we are currently in the society and with the generation yeah. that sees through all these things. Mm. We are no longer in the conventional generation. This is a generation that thinks outside the box. This is, a, this is not the generation that is a hired in a terrible job for the next 10 years and they, they just complain and stick there. These are people who leave and go into entrepreneurship and they're going to try everything until something sticks. And the, the beauty about that is it's very easy to work with these people because they're not stuck in the old age mentality of get born, get a child, get married, get an education, get a good job, leave, retire, die. These are people who are willing to explore more options. These are people who are willing to travel, to see other places, and then, you know, work with that and in those spaces. And that this is the generation that's going to bring that change because we are no longer conventional. We are not the conventional team. We are the team that sees something and says, I want to do that, let me do that. Because how many times does someone go like, she started a company and went and here it is <laughs> and everybody is like in sports and you're like yeah it's one of the most fascinating things i've seen but keeping in mind i'm actually in a group of african women in sports and we have 300 members from africa and roots in africa who are all in sports in different sections i have this amazing lady who's in esports as something that i've been craving to learn and know more about, but manipulate it in the side of the company of where we are and see how we can infuse it as well. Because eSport is growing in Africa. Mm. A few years ago, eSport was my child sits and plays video games. I don't know what to do. He doesn't want to go out. Yeah. But now 
it's our whole career life. Mm, mm, yeah. And we are changing that. And you see, so anytime I'm in a space, I realize that I have an opportunity to influence the younger team and the people my age to look at what I'm doing and even do better. Wow. And they understand it. Wow. Timbo, see, talking to you today was... <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for being a great guest, a wonderful guest of the Think Big for Africa podcast. Thank you for having me. It care. was a long time coming. We kept getting on the stage. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.